694, I think it is in your fine King James Bible. 694 in your fine King James Bible. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 1. And I, and I said there were three things concerning his heart to pray that he dealt with. He dealt with the description of deity. Then he dealt with the duty of deity. And then he delighted in deity. And uh, so we looked at this morning the description of deity. And then I mentioned the last two. And uh, maybe we'll just continue on from that, the idea. <clears throat> and uh, if you have, if you want if you have a true heart, or and I have a true heart to pray, we will spend much time considering the description of God, who God is. We, we will describe, describe His person. We'll describe His power. We'll describe His piety. We'll, we'll describe His presence. Those things that were in that description of deity. And, uh, but then we look at here um, the duty of deity. It is God's duty to listen to our prayer. It is God's duty. And I say that because He is God. And when we can't do anything... What happens is he's the last one we normally go to. We go through everything else we can to figure out how to get the problem solved. But when we come to God, we find out he's the God who hears and answers prayer. Because of the covenant-keeping God, he has told us, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things thou uh, knoweth not. So he makes it, when he says he'll do it, he makes it his duty to do what he says he'll do. For he's the God that can not lie. All right, so we want to look at it is his duty to keep his covenant, his duty to show compassion, and it is his duty to hear our cries. I take this thought. If a firefighter is standing outside of a building and he hears the cries of those inside the building, do you think that he is going to sit back and drink a cup of coffee and tell jokes with his buddies? He can do something sometimes. Sometimes he can't. But he wants to do something if he can do something. He feels it's his duty as a firefighter to go in and try to rescue those people. That is what he has agreed to do. That is what he has put himself out there saying, this is what I do. I save lives that are in fires. I save lives that are in catastrophes. That's what I do. That's what a firefighter does. We would think that a man who signed up to be a firefighter said he was going to be a firefighter and then turned around and walked away and sat there smoking and joking with his buddies while somebody is burning in a fire, we would think of him as criminally black. Would we not? If not, characterly black. It'd be unfathomable in our mind to think of that. Well, God has said that he cares for his saints. God has said that he is a God who keeps his covenant. For him to not uh, keep his covenant, for him not to show compassion, for him not to hear our cries, would make himself criminally liable, if not character-wise liable. Or, I mean, character-wise liable, if not criminally liable himself. God hears the groanings of the prisoners. Psalm 102 tells us. He hears the cries of the captives, as in, in Exodus. And his people were crying for him for all these years to be let go. And he heard their cries and he let them go. And he hears the complaints of the confused. We know in Psalm 142, he, he talks about, uh, look on my right hand, no man cared for my soul. But he deals with this, he said, uh, how's that go? He said, I cried unto the Lord, he inclined unto me and heard me. He brought me up all the from the pit. Is that Psalm 142? I better find Psalm 142. I, 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 now I'm misquoting something. When you think you know something, you don't, you don't you get about, 
Huh? You probably meant also a horrible pit out of the miry clay. Uh, that's that's not, that's why I said I'm thinking I'm missing the quote, miss, missing my verses here. Psalm 40. No, I, I'm right. On, I cried to the Lord with my voice, and my voice I made supplication to the Lord, and did my and I did did I make my supplication? I poured out my complaint before Him. I showed before Him my trouble. My spirit was overwhelmed within me. Then thou knowest my path. In the way where I walk, have they privily laid a snare for me. Okay. So, now I, I knew what verse what verses I was looking for. Where I poured out my complaint, but I couldn't remember all the rest of it. I got to get, get sometimes get things mixed together. Y'all might never have that problem. And uh, I do. So we find that God hears the complaints of the confused. So Nehemiah knew this, that God was a God who uh, had a duty to keep his word. So what did he do? He prayed, confessing the sins of the people and prayed, clarifying with God the covenant that God had bound himself to. God, this is what you said and this is what we did. And we find that, that to be so. You will find in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 1 of Nehemiah that he prayed confessing the sins of the people. He said, Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee now and day for the children of Israel thy servants and confess the sins of the children of Israel which I have sinned or which we have sinned against thee both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. So he comes before God with, a, with saying, God, I know that we have sinned. I know the situation I'm in is my own fault. I put myself in this bondage. I find myself guilty before you. He did not try to skirt the issue and say, well, you just got to understand my situation. You got to understand it wasn't really me. It was, you know, everybody else. That woman that thou gave us to be with me, Lord. Uh, it's the serpent, Lord. That's the blame game that we find in Genesis. That is not the issue that here we find with Nehemiah. He said, I and my father's house have sinned. He said, I am part of this crowd that is guilty before you. We deserve what we've got. It would be a good day in America when somebody stands up in our Congress or in the, in the White House and says, we've sinned, we're guilty, it's our fault that God is not blessing America. It is our fault that we got a person in the White House who is making a mockery of people by putting down everybody, ridiculing everybody who holds something against them. And let me say, I voted for the president, and if he's the one who's running again, I'm not going to vote for somebody who is a pro-baby killer, pro-immorality, and all those things. I am not going to vote for somebody like that. I don't care how much money they can give me or can give to our country. I don't care how much they're going to tax the rich and give to us poor. Because that's I, I am for morality. I'm for righteousness. Righteousness. Right. Yes, things. sir. Yes. Amen. And though I do not like the arrogance of my president, he is my president, and I don't like his arrogance, I don't like the way he goes around uh, mocking people, I don't like any of it, but I do realize one thing, he is more standing for our rights as American citizens than those other side that is trying to take them away, and all they want to do is take away our rights. Right. All they want to do is say that we, it's hate speech for me to say that Sodom is sin. 
They're going to say, you can't talk about people like that. And I, and I tell them, say, I don't understand what your problem is. Sin is sin, whether you like it or you don't like it. Fornication is sin. People don't like that when I say that, but it's a fact. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things. We can deal with all kinds of things. I'm not dealing with that. I'm trying to tell you. Nehemiah said, God, it's your duty to hear us. Because you are a covenant-keeping God. You're a compassionate God. You're, it's your duty to hear us because you, and to listen to us and do something for us because you hear the cries of your people when we come to you with a repentant heart. So it's the duty. And let me just say this. He clarified the covenant of God. He just goes back and says, God, you said this. Remember, verse number 8, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of heaven, yet will, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. He said, I want to clarify the covenant. This is what you said, God. You're the God who cannot lie. You're the God who tells the truth. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you what you said to make sure that you understand, even though I know you understand, I'm going to make sure that I understand and you understand that we're on the same page on this thing. And uh, not like some of y'all who think I, I was on the wrong page and uh, just had to write a song about that. But, uh, th but, they think they're, but we're on the same page and I want you to understand this. And so here's why it's your duty to answer prayer. You're a God who's a covenant-keeping God. You're a God who surprises people. You're a God who has compassion on your people. And I will tell you this from reading that. It's one of the reasons you and I ought to memorize and meditate on Scripture. It's so that we can quote it back to God. We can quote it back to God and say, God, you said this. You said if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked way. You said that you'd hear from heaven. You said you'd heal their land. You said it. This is what you said. If we did this, you do this. So God do it. I, my expectation is you do it because you said you would. And I'm expecting you to do not what I think you are, but you, what you said you would do. My kids, my children have come to me at times and say, Daddy, Remember you said this. I say, nope. They say, well, you did. And I say, when? And they say, well, remember you were busy doing all this other stuff and all this other stuff and your mind was on something else and, and we came to you and asked you if, you if we could do such and such and such and you said yes and, and uh, and I say, uh-huh. No, I don't remember because I was busy with everything else. But if I said it, then I don't want to be a liar. And so we'll do it. Or, at some times, I said, okie dokie, I lied. I'm sorry. Then it really be upset because I'm just like, it's my fault. I'm guilty. I lied. But God is the God that can not lie. And so being that he cannot lie, we can bring his word to him with the expectation that he is a cup. It's his duty now to keep his word, to keep his covenant. He cannot say I made a mistake. He can't say I lied. He can't say no. He had, if he says we're not doing it now, there's got to be a reason why it's not being done now if it's within the covenant that God has given us. 
Now listen to what he says here. In chapter 6 of the book of Hebrews, wherein God will more abundantly show unto their heir, the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us, or hope set before us, which hope having is anchored up of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entered in within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So we find that he's a God that cannot lie. God's covenants are based upon two things, his counsel and his confirmation. He said, by these two unchangeable, immutable things, my counsel stands. What I say goes. He's got a foreknowledge and a foreordained counsel of God. The determinate counsel of God is what he's called in, in the book of Acts. By the determinate counsel of God, by his foreknowledge, and then by wicked hands, they crucified Christ. But God knew what he was doing. God knew why he was doing it, and he had a counsel. Not only did he do, has a counsel, but he confirms things with an oath. He said, not only did I do this, but I swear by the grave. You remember that. Abraham did that. He, made, he, he they confirmed an oath and they, uh, by swearing. God says, I swear to this, that I will do this. I have given you my word on it. It's my counsel and my confirmation. They will not change. So we can be confident that it is the duty of deity to do this and God will do his duty. Then we find our side. That's God's side of this thing. Then we find our side. We have a delight in deity. God knows our heart. Now here's, and, and here's what he says now. And I, I, as, as we read this, he says, um, Lord, I beseech thee, let now thy ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant, the prayer of thy servants, who desire to fear thy name. And so here he is, God, he's telling, he's telling God, these ones that desire to fear your name, he's over here, in verse, that's not verse number 11, and in verse number uh, 5, he says, Be attentive, and uh, the ears open, thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants. So here he is saying, These ones are your servants. These are the ones that are the, the ones that, and your covenant is that if we do this, um, you'll, you're going to take care of us, that you can place you've chosen for us. Because you, your great terror will keep the covenant and mercy for them that love you and observe your commandments. So you made your duty, and we have a desire or a delight in you. Our delight in deity is part of our prayer. If you don't have a delight in God, why would you bring all your cares to care upon him and we care for you? We love him because he first loved us. Because he is a covenant-keeping God, because he's been faithful, then all of a sudden, here we are saying, I want to do thy will, O Lord. I want to do thy will, O Lord. Take me, break me, mold me, and make me. I want to do thy will, O Lord. God, do a work in my life because it's your duty and because I delight to do thy will. I delight in thee. He tells us, if you love me, keep my commandments. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. So we find that this God is saying, on his side, it's his duty. On our side, he should be our delight. We ought to have a desire, a delight to accomplish the will of God if we have a heart to pray. If we don't have a desire to do His will, to love Him, serve Him, keep His commandments, 
And I am not putting us under bondage to the Ten Commandments. I'm talking about love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Love thy neighbor as thyself. This is the first and great commandment. And second is likewise love thy neighbor as thyself. I mean, here we are. If we don't have that kind of desire, if we don't have a desire to live holy as he is holy, if we don't have a desire to be in the house of God, when everything else that the world has takes us away from the house of God, then how can we expect God to answer our prayer? Why would we say, God, I want you to answer my prayer when we don't even have one to take time to spend with you? I asked the question, why do you pray for what you pray for? Nehemiah did not ask God for a position of glory. He didn't say, God, let me go and be the governor over Jerusalem. Let me go fix this problem. He didn't ask God uh, to, to have to, to, to have anything for himself. He said, Lord, I'm broken and I'm burdened over the people and over the place. The citizens of the city. And God, I need you to do something. They need you to do something. He didn't ask God to use him except for as a vessel to get to the king. He said, I'm going to go before the king and ask the king about some things. If you'll let me, God, please show me mercy in his sight. For I am the king's cup bearer. I mean, this granting him mercy in the sight of this man. And uh, I serve him this day and granted mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cup bearer. God, I just want you to let me have some mercy in the sight of the king. When I go before him and present the need of Jerusalem. Would you let me do that? Because if I go before the king and I don't have his mercies, he can put me to death. He asked God to give him mercy to fulfill them so that God could fulfill the word of God for the brethren in Jerusalem. He sneaked up and told God, he said, I'm just a lowly servant. I'm just a king's cupbearer. But I have access to the king and the king can give and do something. And if you show me mercy, I want to go ask him. If you'll grant this for me, I'm not looking for a position of popularity. Of prosperity. All I'm looking for is God you to do a simple thing and answer your covenant for your people. Because all I want to do, I'm not asking you to get me out of this position of being a cupbearer for a king in a strange land. He said, I think all I've all I got is I'm asking you to give me favor in the sight of the king when I start talking to him about the burden. For Jerusalem, for the people. Let me just say this. He was faithful in the little things. He was faithful to God had given him at this point in his life. In a strange land, serving a strange king for a strange purpose. And he said, God, I'll stay here. Just use it on me. I'm trying to get us to understand some simple truths. And if we grasp this, there needs to be a delight in it. Do I love him enough that I'll keep his command? What matters more to you? Living for God? Or for people who think you Living for God or for you to have prosperity. Nehemiah had a heart to fear the Lord. A heart to love the Lord. God had made a promise for them to love him and to keep his commandments. That he would fulfill his covenant. Nehemiah said, we never did. You got to do it. We're delighting you. You've got to be to fulfill your word. Because of who you are. Because of what you can do. Your person, your power. Because of your piety, your character. And because you're an ever present or very present help in trouble. Father, I pray.
Friday.